We gotta quit talking about trade policy. It's it's time to get it done. I'm gonna check you with the blacks. Yo, blacks, you good? You probably do feel a wee bit proud that one of our sons is the most powerful man in the world. Eleven people were shot to death at the Virginia Beach Municipal Complex today. The shooter, who the police chief said was a current city employee, entered Public Works Building Number 2 and began firing indiscriminately sometime after 4 p.m. The suspect is now dead. A Missouri judge is allowing the state's only abortion clinic to keep providing the procedure, at least until Tuesday when they'll be back in court. The state health department is citing health violations in its refusal to renew the clinic's license, which expires at midnight tonight. But Planned Parenthood argues they're only withholding the license as a political tactic. We've seen the reporting to which you're referring. We're doing our best to uh, check it out. Uh, I don't have anything else to add to that. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo was business as usual when asked about the possibility that a North Korean he negotiated with at the last failed nuclear summit was executed. A South Korean paper reports that when Kim Hyok Chol returned, he was killed by firing squad and two of his colleagues were sent to labor camps. But as with most reporting on North Korea, it might be impossible to confirm. Colorado has become the 18th state in the U.S. and the fourth this year to ban conversion therapy for minors. The country's first openly gay governor, Jared Polis, signed the measure into law today, outlawing any type of counseling and therapy that tries to change the sexual orientation of a person under 18. 69 shipping containers loaded with Canadian garbage headed back to their homeland today after spending five years festering in Philippine ports. Canada had promised to take back the trash, which was falsely labeled recyclable, but missed a deadline set by President Rodrigo Duterte. His foreign secretary wasn't shedding any tears from the pier. Tariffs, 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 tariff money. President Trump struck another blow to free trade yesterday, announcing that the U.S. would impose escalating tariffs on imports from Mexico unless it substantially stops the flow of Central American migrants. Because the American and Mexican economies are so tightly connected, tariffs will have an immediate impact on U.S. businesses and consumers who can expect to pay more for avocados, air conditioners, and refrigerators. The hardest hit industry will be the auto business. Automakers' supply chains stretch across the border, and the U.S. imports $93 billion in vehicles and car parts from Mexico every year. So the tariffs will translate into lower profits for automakers and higher prices for car buyers. That won't stop Trump. He's already shown that he'll stick with his tough trade policies, even when they wreak havoc on a key American industry. And we got a perfect storm going on in agriculture right now. We had 10 years of prosperity, and now we got the weather throwing us with the biggest curveball maybe in the last 50 years. And uh, on the political side of it, uh, we got the tariff situation in soybeans. And so uh, all these things are kind of coming together at one time to create uh, a tremendous amount of stress and certainly long-term implications for, uh, for the future. The U.S. and China are still locked in a trade war, and China just put all orders for American soybeans on hold. On top of that, America's farmers are dealing with the most catastrophic planting season in living memory. Months of rain have drowned fields across the country. After 50 crops, I'm well adapted to a high-risk business. It's those things you don't see coming that really uh, can end up nailing you. I can't certainly disagree with the fact that, uh, that the Chinese uh, laws were, were certainly not protecting the people who were doing business over there. They were stealing technology and something needed to be done about that. But basically, the farmer is the guy who got put on the sacrificial block here. The Trump administration spent $12 billion last year compensating farmers for those destroyed markets. A normal 80-acre soybean field is worth about $5,000 in compensation. Corn wasn't hit as hard and got less money, about $200 a field. The payments were supposed to be a one-off thing, but the trade war didn't end. Soybeans have continued to deteriorate. And, uh, you know, a week or so ago, they were down in the $7, low $7 range. So that's $140. My seed and my herbicide cost is that much. So I would really be, have to question my sanity whether to plant at all at that point in time. They're now talking about uh, coming up with a program to make a payment for this year. So that changes that dynamic. 
On May 23rd, the USDA did announce a new round of payments. This time, though, soybeans won't get special treatment. In any given county, rates will be the same for a long list of crops and will be based on how many acres farmers plant, not how much they produce. But at this point, just planting is the biggest challenge. I don't have any beans planted at this point here, and we're knocking on the 1st of June, and uh, I've got about 110 acres of corn planted. Hello? Yeah, hey, hey, I'm on TV right now. Can I call you back later? All right. <laughs> that was a good friend of mine from down in uh, uh, Crawford County. He's only got 300 acres of corn planted and it is so saturated, there's not a chance of it coming up, okay? And uh, he got another inch and three tenths last night, so. <laughs> the season started with bomb cyclones and flooding and then months of rain. Every state is feeling it, but Illinois has taken a particularly bad hit. 70% of the state's soy is normally planted by the end of May. This year, just 14% is in the ground. Nationally, half of cornfields have been planted. It should be more than 90%. A lot of folks during the good times here when they expanded and bought high-priced land and, and traded all their machinery up and they've got debt on that, uh, this, is, this is really a, a, a stressful time for them. Reed Thompson and Aaron Rader are two of those guys. They leased land during the good times, came in and dumped millions of dollars into new technology. The markets are down, and so we we're wondering if we were gonna be able to make it. And the bank wants their, their money on all of our loans, whether, whether we do good or not. Two of the biggest things we can't control are our markets and our weather, and so it's hard to be optimistic and patient with an environment like that the stress can get to you because you're on the hook for so much and then everything's in limbo for the year, you know. Although the new payments could help them keep going, they don't see them as a long-term solution. The payments would be helpful. It's not the way we want it. I mean, the biggest thing is we got to quit talking about trade policy. It's, it's time to get it done. I mean, I could talk about growing a big crop, but till I put it in the ground and take care of it and get the fields ready, what, what good is that? Morning, everybody. It's DJ MV, Angela Yee, Charlemagne the God. We are The Breakfast Club. Let's get some front page news. The Breakfast Club is a drive time show produced by Power 105 in New York and syndicated all around the country. And this is where you'll find basically every high powered Democrat who wants to reach black people. We got a special guest in the building. Yes, sir. Bernie Sanders. Senator Bernie Sanders. Senator Bernie Sanders. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Yesterday, we sat in as the three hosts prepared for yet another Democratic headliner. We got a special guest in the building. Yes, indeed. 2020 presidential candidate Elizabeth Warren. Senator Welcome. Elizabeth Warren. Senator Elizabeth Warren. <laughs> yes. Elizabeth, please. Good morning. Good morning. What about Liz? Liz, I like that. All right. All right. What's All happening, right. Liz? Oh, man, we're out there having fun. Well, fun? Yeah. Let's, start, let's start off with why get into this race. Yeah, why should Liz be running for president? Because... There is so much change we need to make mm -hmm. in this country, and 2020 is our big chance to do it. These interviews are unique in democratic politics. I'm not a person of color. I'm not a citizen of a tribe. And tribal citizenship is an important distinction. No. You kind of like the original Rachel Dozal a little bit. Rachel Dozal was a white woman pretending to be black. Well, this is what I learned from my family. Yeah. Yeah. I don't even know how you they had were. had a lot of confusion back in the day, Ms. Warren. You yeah. thought you was Native American? You thought you was Republican? Like, yeah. when did you get on the when you get on the right track? You got to a fork in the road at some point. Yeah. yeah. You know, a big part of it was when I got into the fights over, you got to make the law reflect their values. You got to have a law that that doesn't just work for those at the top, but that works for everyone else. Why did you ask to come on this show? Well, for two reasons. 
because those are smart, interesting people who ask really good questions and dig into stuff, and because they've got a great audience. And I want to talk to everybody. Do you feel like there's questions you get here that you don't get other places? I feel like it's the depth of the questions. So we get a chance to go deeper on what's happened and how it is that this economy, for example, is not just tilted against all working people, but how it's been really tilted hard against African-Americans. Warren isn't the only candidate who asked to come on The Breakfast Club. All the candidates who come on reach out to the show asking for airtime. Why do you think they call you want to be on your show? I mean, I think the fact that we speak to, what, millions of people a week, and we have a strong hand on the culture. Even just as far as our audience, right, when you come on our show, they might get way more tweets than they normally do, or they might have people that normally wouldn't be watching a CNN, mm -hmm. listening to them and paying attention. Yeah, they're only coming here for our listening audience. They're not coming here for us Three Stooges. What the hell do we know? You know what I'm saying? They're only coming here because of the large listening audience, and it's a large listening audience of black and brown people. The Democratic Party right now seems to think that you three are the gatekeepers to black and brown America. Well, they are wrong. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Okay, because black people are not a monolith. Right. So do we have a lot of black and brown people that listen to our show? Yes. But these politicians, they seem to feel like, okay, I'm going to drop it on the breakfast club, do my check-in with the black and brown community, then get back out to the rest of my campaign. Is this kind of a strange thing, isn't it? Check in with the blacks. Yo, blacks, you good? But isn't that kind of what, how they, doesn't that feel like that's kind of what they're doing? That's exactly what they're doing. I mean, but I'm glad the Breakfast Club is part of their campaign. Sometimes these interviews get clipped into viral <laughs> moments that fly around the internet. Have you ever smoked? I have. Okay. Like and I, and I inhale. I did inhale. I did inhale. <laughs> <laughs> These are freewheeling conversations you're not going to see in a Sunday morning talk show. Well, what about what does you know, reparations look like for you? Because I hear, I hear you say, hey, you know, black people need reparations, but what does that look like? What's the plan for that? Because you got a plan for everything. Mm -hmm. uh, we got a plan. So yeah. the plan here has already started in the House uh, and has already been introduced. It's got, I think it's got about a HR 40? Yeah. It's got okay. about 100 co sponsors. I support this. The hosts admit they have an agenda, but they don't always have the same agenda. Do you feel like uh, white candidates get treated differently than black candidates in here? Absolutely. How in so? here as in the breakfast club? Yeah. Oh. Yeah, I can say that. How do you figure? I don't necessarily think so. I can say that because I'm, I'm, I'll tell you straight up, I'm not looking to elect any more white males, especially for president. You know, I like somebody like Mayor Pete, but when it comes to those old white guys, they're not even going to be here to see the future. So why should they dictate policies on the future? And I don't trust them. It's hard. I think that white male entitlement and privilege has been a super detriment to this country. So yes, when these old white males come in, the, in, this, in this room and you can see the entitlement on them and you can see the privilege on them, yes. I do feel a, a, a different way about that. And I would likely say I feel more of a connection with women and with uh, people of color when they come up here. I'm looking for somebody that's going to run this country the right way. I don't care if you're old. I don't care if you're black, if you're a woman. I just want you to run this country the right way. Look, they've embraced a breakfast club. Democratic Party has embraced a breakfast club. Have they embraced the issues that the breakfast club listeners Have they embraced embrace? black issues? I think that this is the first time we've heard this many candidates talk about a black agenda. This many candidates talk about reparations. I think for a long time they have been ignoring their most loyal fan base, which is black people. And I think that a great question that is being asked is, you know, why do we continue to vote Democrat, you know, for, for just because? In April, a group of men yelling homophobic slurs jumped Malaysia Booker in a parking lot, and a video of the beating went viral. <laughs> Malaysia spoke out about the assault at a rally. This time it was me, the next time it could be someone else. Our time to seek justice is now. <laughs> If not now, when? Malaysia, Malaysia. On May 18th, she was found dead from a gunshot to the head. Malaysia. 
She got jumped the day after my birthday. And when she came to my house, like, what was so crazy is that after she got jumped, her spirit wasn't even broken. Like, she was broken, but Malaysia was so full of love, like, you couldn't hold a real B down. <laughs> Malaysia Booker was one of five trans women murdered in the U.S. so far this year. She was one of 133 killed in the last six years, more than two-thirds of whom were black. Miko Hicks is a friend of Malaysia's. Do you think of the video of Malaysia getting attacked hadn't gone viral and hadn't been seen by as many people as it was, that her death would have gotten as much attention as it has? No. No. It wouldn't have. She'd have been another trans woman that got killed. She didn't want to be public. Malaysia was terrified after this happened. What she wanted to do was let it all go. Malaysia had reason to be afraid. Most murders of Black trans women happen in the South. But Dallas is supposed to be different. Since at least the 1970s, it's had a vibrant LGBT community concentrated in the historic neighborhood of Oak Lawn. But Oak Lawn has changed drastically over the past few years. Today, the neighborhood is 75% white, with an average income of $60,000 a year, more than twice as much as in South Dallas, where Malaysia lived. Tell me a little bit about Dallas, and specifically about being trans in Dallas. When I first came out, probably about 20 years ago, the Cedar Springs, Oak Lawn area was covered in all kinds of people. White, Hispanic, black, trans women all over the place. What they did to get rid of it, they knocked down everything, built these really new expensive high-rise apartments with the little shopping centers in the bottom of them and made everything pretty and ritzy that we couldn't afford. It makes us feel like we're not wanted anywhere. We're not wanted in the black community. We grew up here, we live here. We're not wanted here. And now we're not wanted in the gay area either. The Dallas Police Department refused our interview requests for this story and has said there's no evidence linking the murder to the beating. But a week after Malaysia's death, it held a town hall at the Resource Center, a long-standing LGBT organization in Oak Lawn. I want to take a moment to emphasize that the Dallas Police Department stands in support of the LGBTQ plus community. Several white people in attendance praised the police department for all the progress it had made in relating to the LGBT community. Mine really isn't a question, it's a thank you. 16 years ago, I was elected as the Democratic precinct chair in the Oak Lawn area. And while I was working my precinct, I was stopped by Dallas PD and challenged as a prostitute. I thank you so much for the drastic change because the encounters I have with the police now are very, very different. Thank you. But this was one of the first opportunities people had to ask the police about Malaysia's murder. And the meeting became a case study in intersectionality. As we hear this conversation about Malaysia, we continue to say LGBT, 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 LGBT. But Malaysia also was a black woman. And this crime happened in a predominantly black part of town. You know, why are we not hosting, you know, a meeting like this in Oak Cliff, East Dallas, where it happened? And talk about, you know, what does that mean for that, to ha you know, that conversation to happen? One of the issues is the lack of trust. I think this is important for anyone in the room to hear what do you need specifically from the community? How can we contact? What does that look like? The public is encouraged. They can call the tips line. They can call Crime Stoppers. They can call the Dallas Police Homicide Unit. We're asking the community to get involved. That community is a no snitch community. They're not going to give anybody up. You have to be proactive and get on the sites and look. These people wanted the world to know that they beat that girl up. 
They wanted the world to know that who they were and that they did it. Leslie McMurray is the Trans Education and Advocacy Coordinator at the Resource Center. So there's what, what appears to be a very progressive and inclusive community for LGBT people here in Dallas. Is it that way for everyone? Is it that way for Black trans people? I would say not as much. Uh, I certainly enjoy privilege that many don't. Uh, I live in kind of a safer suburb on the north part of Dallas. My wife is an attorney. Uh, so we have a pretty good life, and I'm well aware of that privilege that exists. A lot of people look at a place like Oak Lawn, which is very welcoming, has this history of being a very safe, sort of queer place, and yet they see it as being exclusive or unattainable, right? W why is that? Well, I, uh, gentrification in a word. That, that has a racial component to it, right? Yes and no. I mean, it certainly has a racial component, but you can't define it solely by race because it's not a case of black people are poor and white people are rich. Poor is poor. And poor doesn't know color. Money doesn't know color. And the night begins. It's too big. It's, too, it's a little too big for me to be honest, but you know, boots run small. So the I got friends like, Malaysia left behind say they have no one to rely on but themselves. You know, somebody gotta go, come up here and put on the show. But it ain't all that bad. Robin Crow, who goes by Pocahontas, is one of them. Last Saturday, both Malaysia and Pocahontas were scheduled to perform at one of the last black bars in Oak Lawn. Cedar Springs is it's, it's more where the Caucasian people go hang out or either the um, uppity crowd. Was it, uppity? Was it, it became that way not too many years ago. We used to have a, a club over there called Havana's that we would go to. But even at Havana's, we would get harassed and stuff, dragged out of the club, pepper sprayed and stuff like that. That's supposed to be the place where where the LGBT people are safe and comfortable in theory. The, and it is for people that look like you. But for people that look like me, it's not a safe place for us. Well, look, I have a special relationship to Scotland because of my mother. My mother was born in Scotland, in Stornoway. The special relationship between our two countries has been one of the great forces in history for justice and for peace. And by the way, my mother was born in Scotland, Stornoway, which is serious Scotland. Actually, Marianne McLeod was born in Tong about three miles away. And she grew up in Stornoway, the daughter of a fisherman. Before setting sail for New York in the 1930s and marrying a real estate developer from Queens, she lived in this teensy home. The sentimentalist-in-chief stopped here during a 2008 business trip and spent less than two minutes inside. As Trump prepares for his first official state visit to the UK on Monday, we asked the Islanders just how special the relationship with Trump is. As far as Trump goes, uh, we know that his ancestry is here. He still has relatives here who are decent, hardworking, well-integrated individuals, highly regarded in this community. But I cannot say the same for Donald Trump. The, the, the true islanders probably do feel a wee bit proud that one of our sons is the, the most powerful man in the world. I know that he, at one time, was invited to contribute to a renovation of the, of the castle in Stornoway. I think they expected, well, OK, put your hand in your pocket and, and help us out. He didn't. He doesn't behave like somebody from the Hebrides would behave. He's like a spoiled child who should have had his bum smacked when he was young. It's Hippocratic, really, because he's an immigrant himself, basically. His father's from Germany, his mother's from Lewis. He's, he's an immigrant. Very sad to see British politicians running to laud him and welcome him to the UK because his kind of politics don't really belong here. He's the president of the United States. There's nothing wrong with him coming on a state visit. He's quite entitled to, to do that, but I don't think he'd be welcomed with open arms everywhere he goes. But that happens all over the world. 
How would you describe him in Gaelic? I suspect you wouldn't get one word that would actually capture it all. His kind of pomposity and so on. Um, Daniel Anderson. Uh, eccentric is probably the word. Charak Amitan. A fool. Guhan. This basically means a windbag. It's Guhan. So there's one for your dictionary. Freedom Dividend will help eliminate income inequality. We can all use an extra $1,000 a month. $1,000 a month would solve homelessness. It would solve so many problems, and we can only find the positive benefits if we give it a shot. How do you know it'll motivate people? Won't it just let some people be satisfied with living in poverty? But I'm a big, big fan of this because the there's no real other solution for the automation or AI crisis. Americans are shareholders in this country and they should be sharing in the wealth of the country. 